Uh, welcome everybody to the UC San Francisco Stanford Searcy FDA Distinguished Speaker Series on Cybersecurity for Biomedical Engineering. I am Kevin Fu, Acting Director of Medical Device Cybersecurity at the US Food and Drug Administration. And it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, the speaker for today. Uh, before we do that, uh, I have just a few housekeeping notices to go through. Uh, first of all, a disclaimer, this seminar series does not represent official FDA policy or guidance, and the contents are those of the speakers and do not necessarily represent the official views of nor an endorsement by FDA, Health and Human Services, or the US government. This seminar is being recorded. A couple administrative notes. The academic season is concluding. This uh, seminar series will go on hiatus and will resume in September on the third Thursdays. So there is a hiatus from June to August. Also, my role as acting director of medical device cybersecurity uh, is concluding this month, but I'll be remaining engaged with the agency and the Searcy FDA seminar series uh, while I return to my academic uh, university role. And then finally, at the end of today's seminar, we really hope you'll stick around to fill out a very short three question Zoom poll so that we can gather your thoughts on this seminar series and constantly improve it. One more announcement, FDA is hiring. Uh, if, you would, uh, if you have interest in joining the FDA to help with the medical device cybersecurity mission, uh, mission uh, we are hiring PhDs uh, for work on medical device security. And you can contact Diane Mitchell at diane.mitchell at fda.hhs.gov if you'd like to hear more about these opportunities for cybersecurity engineering of medical devices. A little bit about me, uh, you can read this on your own time, but again, I'm the Acting Director of Medical Device Cybersecurity, FDA, and I will be serving uh, as your moderator. Uh, again, my role concludes shortly. Uh, you're always welcome to reach out if you'd like to stay in contact, and you can probably find me best uh, on LinkedIn. So why are we here today? Well, healthcare computer security, as well as medical device se computer security, has evolved over the last 10 years from hypothetical sort of science fiction to real world threats. And so just a little more than a month ago, a couple months ago, the Wall Street Journal published a news article talking about, for instance, the Conti ransomware group. And this ransomware group had their chat transcripts accidentally, or excuse me, uh, disclosed on the internet and one of the disclosure was their plans to attack hundreds of hospitals in the United States. So the world of medical device security has evolved from hypothetical lab-based threats 10, 20 years ago to today, which has become nation state level as well as organized crime, very highly financially motivated adversaries. And so it's very important to have security built in rather than bolted on after the, uh, after the fact. Within the United States, we have a, a, a quite a bit of legislative activity, uh, as well as executive orders from our president to try to close the gap on cybersecurity problems and infrastructure and medical devices in particular. And at the US Food and Drug Administration, you can now find our draft guidance online for public comment about quality system considerations and pre-market submissions uh, when it relates to the cybersecurity engineering that goes into the medical device design. You can also find a draft bill legislation going through the US House and Senate uh, pertaining to expectations of medical device security engineering uh, in the pre-market. But with that in mind, it's my pleasure today for uh, our concluding seminar of the academic season to have Professor Ross Anderson from Edinburgh University and the University of Cambridge. Uh, today, he is going to talk about security engineering of machine learning. Uh, Ross is a prolific author. Uh, he is the author of the book Security Engineering, uh, which is on the desk of essentially every security engineer I've ever uh, known over the last uh, 20 or 30 years. Uh, he is also a fellow of the Royal Society, uh, uh, for, a fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering and Churchill College. Uh, he has a long and decorated past, and I often credit him as uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, grandfathers, maybe, of healthcare security. I think I saw him give a talk on this topic in 1997. Uh, so he's usually a, a decade or two ahead of the curve. And uh, I'd like to welcome him uh, to the virtual stage and um, really hope that today with our mostly biomedical engineering uh, 
uh, audience that uh, Professor Anderson can impart some knowledge from security engineering uh, in the context of biomedical engineering product uh, design and manufacturing. So thank you, Ross, uh, for joining us across the pond uh, from the UK today at uh, that your late but still sunny hour. Good, okay. Many thanks, Kevin, for this um, kind introduction. Here's a brief outline of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, to focus things, I'm going to start on an immediate challenge that we face in the UK and in Europe. Um, as Kevin mentioned, I've been working on healthcare IT since 1995. Uh, when I got hired part-time by the British Medical Association to advise them on the safety and privacy of uh, clinical information systems. So we're going to look at clinical security policies, ethics of research with cloud-based records and safety, security and sustainability, um, which will uh, get us at a, a fair clip through 20 odd years worth of um, some of our engagement with this. And then I'm going to talk about the neural network revolution and try and raise a number of topics that um, you may not have heard about. Firstly, should machine vision be robust or fragile? Um, everybody talks about robustness, but is that what's really needed? Do you engineer for the average case or for the worst case? This is important if you're providing regulated devices on which people's safety will depend. Do you need to sanitize input? And then finally, there's the question of how robots and people can work together, because as I'm sure many of you are aware, um, safety usability um, is often the big safety um, problem with medical devices. So here's our immediate challenge. Um, artificial intelligence and machine learning are being accepted as a reason for many firms to get access to bulk personal health data in circumstances that our privacy and other regulators wouldn't have allowed a few years ago. For example, in the UK, we've got something called HDR UK, which is creating safe havens with the health records of millions of patients. And these are being used as play pens in which startups can train AI models, which they hope will turn into medical devices. Uh, what about the privacy of the people whose data is being used, often without their consent? And what about the safety of the devices that result from that? In the European Union, um, just a few days ago, uh, the Commission announced a new European health data space, which is an aspiration in the same direction. Now, we know that there's a lot of potential here. Deep neural networks can help um, in medical image analysis, um, looking uh, at optical tomograms for macular de degeneration, for example, uh, much uh, more quickly and accurately than ophthalmologists can. But we've also got some abuse cases, for example, the Royal Free Hospital in London, which I'll come to later. So uh, what about safety and privacy in this new world? Well, um, as we all know, safety is heavily tied up with usability. And um, just last week, I was giving my um, freshman class on software and um, security engineering um, the story of um, what happened um, with the uh, Tharac 25 medical accelerator back in 1985. More recently, people like Harold Thimbleby um, have documented the fact that safety usability failures with infusion pumps kill about as many people as motor vehicles. So this is a big deal and people are realizing it more and more. The second thing is privacy, because in the old days, the privacy of records uh, that were used in direct care in surgeries and hospital worlds used to depend on the fact that paper records were local or when things were put onto PCs, these PCs were servers that sat in the local practice. Now that you move to cloud-based medical records, there's an awful lot of pressure for access. How do we regulate that? Well, this is still um, a matter for debate and discussion in the USA, uh, but in, in Europe, since 2010, we've had the IV Finland case in the European Court of Human Rights, which declares that everybody in the Council of Europe countries, which includes Britain as well as the EU, has got the right to restrict our personal health data to the physicians and others involved directly in our healthcare. But it was a very long road to get there. And even over a decade later, the consent mechanisms still don't work properly because it takes a long time to replace all of the hospitals, all the computers in a hospital system. Now, we used to have compartmentation that sort of worked, but this got gutted um, in a modernization program that the Blair government started in 2001. And although the Cameron government stopped that in 2010, we've still got a lot of these uh, privacy invasive systems. <clears throat> 
What people often try and do here, um, as in the USA, um, is to claim that anonymization will fix it. Now, um, here's some samples of data from the key UK law case, Source Informatics. Um, this was a system uh, that was used to anonymize doctors' prescribing habits uh, so that the information could be sold to drug companies as a basis for calculating the sales commission payable to their sales representatives. And initially, they started out with a system whereby you might have 20 doctors in one town, and they would simply give the number of prescriptions written by each doctor for a particular type of drug um, um, uh, anonymized and aggregated by week. And so you might see that for a particular uh, type of antidepressant, for example, Dr. One had written 17, 21, and 15 prescriptions in the first three weeks of last year, and that Dr. Two had written 20, 14, and three prescriptions. And what people discovered was that the um, drug company representative could say, aha, that's Susan Smith at the Guildhall practice because she went skiing um, in the middle of January last year. So it turned out when we studied this that it needed an awful lot more done to it. It needed um, noise added in terms of jitter and, and all the rest of it. And um, people nowadays realize that anonymization is really hard. And most of the anonymization that's used with medical records is even less effective because usually it just boils down to removing the patient's name and address and um, replacing this with some kind of patient number. Now, there was um, a telling article written by Paul Orme about 10 years ago to the effect that anonymization is a broken promise of privacy because computer scientists have known since about 1980 that anonymization is really hard. And yet policymakers want to pretend that it works and they want really, really badly. And so they keep on pretending and pretending and pretending. And we're seeing this coming back again in, in the new era of artificial intelligence, where people talk about uh, federated differential privacy. Um, and if you believe that, um, I've got a bridge I'd like to sell you. But anyway, let's press on. Fast forward to 2015, and the problem um, as we faced it in the UK was this. Um, we had lots more data. You've got cloud-based primary and secondary care records. You've got genomics. By that time, we were scaling up to 100,000 patients having full genome sequencing uh, done for various research and piloting uh, purposes. And now the same team that was doing that seven years ago is now plotting to put together a project to sequence the entire population. What are the implications of that? In addition, you've got patient generated stuff like Fitbit and you've got communications data and lab data and all sorts of other stuff. So what this is meaning is that there's an awful lot more capability um, to store and process data, uh, which means that an awful lot more stuff can leak. And this has led to scandals. In 2013, we had what was called the care.data scandal, where the NHS sold about a billion Finnish consultant episodes from all the hospitals in England and Wales. Basically, every secondary care um, uh, episode from 1998 to 2012 was sold to a thousand plus corporate users worldwide for the princely sum of about 2,000 pounds. And this was everywhere from you know, respectable research universities through to drug companies in places like China. There was another scandal where the Royal Free Hospital gave over a million patient records to Google DeepMind so that Google could uh, develop um, an app to diagnose kidney disease. And because it was too much effort to pull out the 55,000 or so records of patients who had actually had kidney disease, the Royal Free just gave Google all their medical records database. And eventually the privacy regulator, the, um, uh, the information commissioner in the UK, reprimanded the Royal Free Hospital for doing this, but they didn't um, actually order Google to destroy the records. Perhaps they didn't feel that they had the money for a big legal battle. Anyway, against that background, um, a dozen of us were recruited by the Nuffield Bioethics uh, Council um, to ask what happens to medical ethics in this kind of world. And um, the conclusion that we came to, um, having uh, looked at this in detail, and you can get our, our report online, of course, it, 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 it gives you a, a very detailed analysis of what the state of play was seven years ago, but that inevitably people doing medical research will have to 
um, end up dealing with sources that have got some objection to them or another, they've been collected without patient consent, uh, and so on and so forth. And within this world, um, you're best dealing with four principles. First is respect for persons, that people have got moral interest in their data and it can't just be treated as raw material. The second thing is human rights. You have to respect um, human rights law, including the IV Finland judgment. And that means that you need to know how to interpret it and what sort of context to place it in, which in turn means that you have to determine the expectations of the patients um, whose data you're using. And this leads to a principle of participation in that if you can't get consent from everyone, then at least you need to have a body that fairly represents the full range of relevant interests and values. So the objection that we're making here is to the standard um, institutional review board, as it's called in America, or ethics committee, as it's called in Britain, whereby a medical professor invites half a dozen of his mates from other universities to sit in a committee which approves his research, and um, um, he then returns the favour by sitting on, on their committee. That doesn't work because you don't have the full range of patients, you don't have disabled patients, minority patients, you don't have privacy activist patients. You're getting a very, very narrow view um, of um, what expectations are going to be. And finally, when you screw up, you've got to own up. You've got to tell people what you're going to do with their data and what happened to it after the fact, including when there's a control failure. And these principles are now the principles that we use in our security research too. So that's to set the background as we were in 2015. And in that year, we started doing a project for the European Commission on what happens to safety and security once there's software and everything. So this is focused more on the safety side than on the privacy side. And it was a fairly broad study because the European Union regulates dozens of industries, toys, railway signals, airplanes, all sorts of stuff like that. And so how should it update regulation and regulators to cope with the arrival of software? Now, we did three representative case studies. One was um, road vehicles, one was medical devices, and one was electricity substations, because our team happened to have some expertise in these areas. And the underlying methodology that we used was the economics of information security. Now, some of you will be familiar with this and some of you not, but um, given that you have got a center studying regulatory science, it's something that you may care to take a look at. Information security economics is a discipline that we've developed um, over the past 20 odd years when we started to realize that things often went wrong uh, because of perverse incentives. If Alice guards a system and Bob pays the cost of failure, then you can expect trouble. And the same applies to safety as much as to security. So you end up building uh, models of what's likely to go wrong, perverse incentives, asymmetric information, and so on and so forth. And then once you've got the models, you've got to check whether they apply to the real world. So you make measurements of what is going wrong. You look at things like the patching cycle and malware and fraud. And in fact, at the moment, we've got a cyber security um, center at Cambridge where we collect lots and lots of data on things like fraud and malware. And this enables us to test security economics theories against the bad things that are happening in, in real life. And um, my strong suggestion was that if, is, is that if you're a healthcare medical device regulator, you need to be collecting similar amounts of data so that you can similarly build models um, of what may go wrong in incentive terms with safety, and you can test these models against real world data. Now, since 2001, the security economic side of things has grown from zero to over 100 active researchers. And in fact, our um, annual event is the workshop on the economics of information security, which will take place in Tulsa, Oklahoma on the 21st and 22nd of June. So if you want to get involved in this and meet the people who are active in it, um, there's a plenty of time to book your plane and your hotel. And the security economics community has been coming up with policy recommendations, um, which for about 10 years now have started being adopted in both the USA and Europe. And the, the interesting thing about this from your point of view is that there are many lessons that will go across to safety and dependability uh, pretty well um, um, unchanged. And in fact, um, a number of the things that we did in our work for the EU have got direct relevance to safety.
So the broad questions that we um, dug up when we looked at the various things that went wrong um, with cars, with medical devices and with electricity substations, were first of all, who's going to investigate incidents and to whom will they be reported? As you may know, the medical device regulators in many countries um, operate a front-loading regime whereby they look at a whole lot of documentation um, about a particular medical device and then they sign it off and they don't want to know anything more about it afterwards. They don't monitor um, uh, casualties, they don't monitor accidents. And we've known since at least the Therac accidents back in the mid-1980s that that isn't a good way of doing things. So one way or another, you've got to have a, a feedback mechanism that closes the loop so that incidents go back into updating standards and, if need be, uh, mandating recalls for defective equipment. The next thing is how do you embed responsible disclosure? Because the incentive for people when things go wrong is just to say, well, we've got an NDA, so you mustn't talk about that. Uh, there's got to be some way that breaks that. And in the world of security, of course, you have got things like the bug bounties, you've got things like the cert system, so that if people find that there is a way of um, going in over Wi-Fi to subvert a, a, an infusion pump, for example, there's a pathway whereby they can report it, where it will be brought forcefully to the attention of the regulators and the vendors, and the person doing the disclosure is not going to be sued. So how that works may vary from one sector to another, but it tends to, uh, in many sectors, involve disclosing um, either to um, uh, an OEM that has set up an explicit bug bounty program, or if that doesn't happen, then doing the disclosure to the, to the regulators. Next question is, how do you bring safety engineers and security engineers together? Because they tend to be separate professions with different languages, different conferences, and so on. There's then the question of will regulators all need security engineers? It's great that uh, Kevin got hired by the FDA, uh, but um, how many regulators are there in America with safety critical functions and how many of them have got a cyber security person on board? And how do the other regulators access cyber security expertise? And then there are business questions such as how do you prevent abuse of lock-in? How do you prevent device makers using security arguments um, to um, done their customers for money. Um, uh, in, in passing, I might mention the various cases that are running against the, um, the app stores run by Apple and Google, where Apple say they have to lock down apps for um, security reasons, or, and by the way, we need to take 30% of all the revenue. That may not be as relevant in medical devices, but lock-in is still an issue um, in, in, in some sectors. So the policy recommendations included requiring vendors to self-certify that products can be patched, requiring a secure development lifecycle with vulnerability uh, management, creating expertise in security engineering in Brussels to support policymakers. That's now being done by ANISA. Uh, we tried to get them to extend the product liability directive to services, which hasn't um, happened yet and updating the NIS, the Network and Information Security Directive, to report breaches and vulnerabilities to safety regulators and users. The NIS directive has been worked on, but that hasn't happened yet. Anyway, these were the recommendations from um, the work that we did. And there's one thing that struck us with a considerable amount of force when we'd done this work. It wasn't really part of the mandate, but it's part of the conclusions. And it's this, we roughly speaking know how to make um, two types of secure device. Um, you can have things like phones and laptops, which you patch monthly, but then you make them obsolete quickly so you don't have to support a hundred different models. And then there's things like cars and medical devices, which we test to death before release. And we didn't used to connect them to the internet. And so we almost never patched them. And OK, so what's going to happen to support costs now that we're starting to patch cars and medical devices? This has become a real big deal for the car industry, right? Because patching cars is expensive, um, particularly if the patches are mandated in all vehicles that don't have over the air software update, because then they have to be re recalled and stuff has to be reflashed in a garage and that costs real money. What's the equivalent with medical devices? So. Once this um, bubbled away in the policy machinery, 
the result that we got um, after a couple of earlier attempts was a, a directive, Directive 2019-771 on sales of goods, which is there basically to ensure that if you have got a, if you sell a device with software components, whether the software is in the device or in an app or in a, a backend um, um, web service, then that um, software has to be maintained for um, at least two years or longer if that's a reasonable expectation of the consumer. And for things like cars and washing machines, that means 10 years after the last instance has left the showroom. And this is what's causing great distress in the car industry, because this means that they now have to design um, and plan for maintaining software for 20 years. Three years in R&D, seven years in the showroom, and 10 years after that. Now, surely we, could, we should expect nothing less from medical devices, even although most medical devices aren't technically consumer goods and therefore aren't covered by this particular directive. However, we do have medical device directives um, in Europe, and um, there was a 2017 directive revised with stuff coming into force in 2021, um, which requires post-market surveillance, a per device risk management plan and ergonomic design uh, in order to deal with the issues that we had been talking about earlier. And the cybersecurity piece of this says, for example, in clause 17.2, for devices that incorporate software, software shall be developed in accordance to the state of the art, taking into account the principles of development life cycle, risk management, including information security, verification, and validation. Now, there's, there's still one or two loopholes that the device makers can and will use to wiggle, but that's an enormous improvement on what went before. And we hope that the regulatory heft of the European Union uh, will benefit people in the USA as well, because a, a sane medical device maker will probably want to just make all the stuff worldwide um, uh, comply with European regulations rather than have to maintain two separate production lines, uh, one for um, Europe and one for um, the USA. Uh, but, um, you know, this is a part of a process and we have to see where it goes and if the FDA can contribute to this by you know, further elaborating this, then that would be absolutely great. So how does this interact with machine learning, which um, Kevin wanted me to talk about? Well, I've got a student, Ilya Shemailov, who's just got his thesis approved, and he's off to get a job in Oxford in uh, October, a research fellowship at Christchurch, which is very prestigious. And um, his PhD work was funded by Bosch, a company that makes car parts, um, and they're particularly concerned uh, about their machine vision systems. These vision systems are used, for example, in automatic lane keeping, automatic emergency braking, and other um, things that modern cars do. Now, since 2012, when there was a big breakthrough by uh, one team in Toronto and another team in Zurich on uh, networks, uh, the, the, the deep neural networks are known to work way better than anything else for image recognition. And so that's what people use um, if you're doing something like automatic emergency braking. But the, the problem is that deep neural networks are vulnerable to adversarial inputs. And if you try and make them robust against these adversarial inputs, um, it damages performance. So there was a bit of a panic in the industry when people said, well, um, if somebody can use a data projector to project a, a picture onto a motorway bridge that will cause cars to swerve and crash, what can we do about that? And vendors started detuning their neural networks in order to make them less susceptible to these attacks in order to make them more robust. And this leads to a question, but um, is this actually a realistic threat model? If you're worried about somebody um, on a motorway bridge attacking a car that's going underneath, then surely the thing to do is just drop a brick through the windscreen. Um, or if it's um, an attempted assassination by a state level actor, you know, to fly a drone overhead and uh, just fire a missile into the car. You're not going to mess around with trying to tweak the machine vision system. You'll, you, you, you'll do a, a, a direct physical attack. So if attacks are possible, but rare and not scalable, and they're the kind of attacks that we don't worry about anyway. You know, we don't 
worry about cars having bricks dropped through the windscreen. It's, it's, it's too low in the threat model. Um, why don't we instead take the approach of detecting attacks instead and sounding an alarm? Now, most current automatic driver assistance systems assume that the driver will remain alert enough to take over if the um, vehicle gets confused. And there's a separate story about that, as you may be aware. Uh, but let's just go with that assumption for now. The question that then arises is, how can you make the alarm hard to defeat? In other words, how can you make systems that, in, that, that include machine learning components um, respond in an evident way to uh, attempts to tamper? I mean, this is another approach that's taken in healthcare ever since the Tylenol scale, scare. You um, get your medicine in tamper evident packaging of various kinds. So, surely an appropriate way forward uh, is to insist that the machine learning components in medical devices have got an appropriate tamper evidentness property. So, let's look at adversarial inputs. Um, here's um, uh, test picture from the data set that's normally used for training and evaluating um, these kind of image classification uh, DNNs. And the picture on the left, the original one, is in class bird. It's a, a, a thumbnail of a photo of an ostrich. And what people discovered back in 2013, two separate groups discovered fairly quickly that you could use the gradient descent methods to come up with small tweaks to the image. And in the middle picture here, I've enormously amplified the, um, uh, the tweak that you do. This is just basically a tweak to these significant bits. Um, and by doing this visually imperceptible tweak to the image, you can persuade the classifier to misclassify the bird as an automobile. Now, the theoreticians have proved that adversarial examples exist for all deep neural network models. The, the mathematician Adi Shamir proved this by a counting argument. These models are, have got such high dimensionality and they've got such convoluted decision boundaries that inevitably adversarial examples will exist. And what's more, we've discovered that attacks are findable and often transferable. And there are pretty powerful techniques for finding um, adversarial examples. And there's a, a growing literature on ways in which you can um, port them from one application to another. So let's have a look at the kind of um, attacks that we're, we're worried about. If you have got, uh, want, if you want to tell cats and dogs apart, um, you have got uh, some instances of class dog and some instances of class cat. And adversarial examples will tend to go in at the boundary of what is a dog and what is a non-dog. And they try and do it in such a way that a human would actually confuse the adversarial example as being um, a dog. But this isn't the only thing that's going on because there are all sorts of other inputs are possible as well. What happens if you um, have got a, a class morph, a cat dog? Um, what happens if there's no signal at all? What happens if there's a Pokemon? Um, if you've got a system whose um, job is to spot cats and dogs and it sees a Pokemon, something that should not happen in, in real life, then surely you expect to see some kind of an alarm. So how can we actually implement this? Well, here's the first idea we had. Um, if you've got kids, you will know that you train your kids um, from the cradle to a very beautiful manners and not um, say any rude words that would scare your mother. And then age five or six or seven, depending on which country you live in, the kids go off to school and by the end of the week, they know some words that your mother definitely doesn't like. They break social taboos. And so what this um, tells us is that taboo breaking is evidence of exposure to adversarial input. So the questions that we then ask is, can you set taboos, whether on outputs or on activations during training and then alarm when we see them? And the answer is yes, this works rather well. Um, you um, retrain your neural network so that certain outputs are not allowed, forbidden um, uh, speech. And indeed that certain intermediate activations aren't allowed, you know, forbidden thoughts. Uh, and you just alarm when we see them. 
And the interesting thing um, is that you can diversify one classifier with a bunch of different taboos. So if you're producing a machine vision system that you're selling to uh, Mercedes and Volkswagen and Saab and uh, Peugeot and so on, you can sell them each a slightly different system. So then it's an attack that's found on one of them won't work on the others. Uh, you can uh, diversify it even more than that. And this is, if you like, a first interaction of crypto with machine learning. There's a number of other alarms, and one of the alarms that people worry about if they're trying to produce medical devices that are based on ML classifiers is they worry about model extraction. Um, and corporates worry about this an awful lot more than about data subject privacy. And there's already a literature on this. I've given you an example there. Sokol and his colleagues have detected, have developed various ways to detect this by tracking all the questions that a particular classifier is asked and thereby detecting model extraction attempts. And this is also an example of an alarm because what you're doing then um, is alarming either your medical device or the backend server on which it relies for doing its classification. The third thing that you might worry about in addition to um, integrity and confidentiality is availability. Now, classical computer security neglected availability until the 1990s, and then we got hit, of course, with all sorts of denial of service attacks. So one of the things that, that we asked is, can you do this in machine learning? Um, could you come up with some kind of uh, input which would stall a classifier or maybe even cause the machine to catch fire? And the answer is yes. Um, what you can do is just as you do um, gradient descent to find adversarial examples um, in, in the normal model, um, you can use gradient ascent to, to try and find, do a pessimization process whereby you find the, the worst possible input uh, for a given um, classifier to deal with. And um, uh, there's the, um, the arts of number for that paper there. And it turned out that we discovered a very wide range of what we call sponge attacks, which all um, target various kinds of optimization in both um, hardware and software. And while you can slow down machine vision systems a bit, maybe 20% or so, what we found is that where you've got more complex machine learning systems, and in particular natural language processing systems, they're particularly vulnerable uh, because um, you, you end up engaging some kind of exception processing. Um, if you pose some kind of um, conundrum to a natural language processing system or tell it a riddle or even a joke, you know, uh, time flies like an arrow, fruit flies like a banana, which caused people to stop and say, uh, what was that? Oh, yes, ha, 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 ha. Then it has the same kind of effect on an NLP system. And another thing that we discovered entirely by accident is that if you um, get some Russian text and you randomly drop um, three Chinese characters in it and feed it into Google Translate, then that causes um, Google Translate to take 6,000 times as long to translate that Russian into English. What's going on there, we just don't know. Maybe the data center in Russia is phoning up the data center in Hong Kong and saying, hey, Fred, this is one of yours. What's going on here? Or the equivalent of that. And so this teaches that machine learning systems have to be designed for worst case rather than average case, or else, or, or, or else you have to place limits in computation. And how this may pop up in the course of doing um, evaluations of medical devices, I don't know. Um, if you're doing something similar, some, something simple image processing, like going through a bunch of optical tomographs and looking for um, macular degeneration, it may not be an issue, but if you're doing something more complex involving a speech interface, um, yes, um, Kevin, you had your hand up? Well, since you mentioned it and you opened the door to that question, I'm just curious, what's your reaction to, uh, for instance, the medical device world, which is much more accustomed to stochastic failure, uh, probabilistic, you know, Gaussian distributions of failures, and, you know, for instance, saying, well, there's a a one in a million chance uh, that this could happen with the Chinese characters and Russian text. How would you respond productively uh, to explain the, the change in modeling when, when you're dealing with a, a threat model or a threat actor? Well, um, in, if you've just got stochastic failure, um, you could think of it as Murphy's computer. You know, if it can go wrong, it will. But once you get adversarial action, you've got Satan's computer, 
because it, it will do the worst possible thing to you at the worst possible time, right? The adversary knows that there's a, a one in a million chance that the thing will fail. He figures out precisely the one input in a million that will cause it to fail. And then at the most inconvenient possible moment, he hammers all the visible instances of that device with exactly that one in a million input. So um, when you go from random failure to malicious failure, what you have to think of very carefully is whether there's um, a findable input that will cause the failure. And in the case of adversarial machine learning, the answer to that is yes, the mathematics says so. And then the question is, can you actually scale an attack? Now, if the medical device is actually looking at a live patient in front of you, uh, or in a patient that's attached, attached to an optical tomograph, then maybe the attack is not scalable, because you cannot get lots of patients with um, you know, appropriate contact lenses under the machine. But there, there, there may be other cases uh, where the, um, the adversarial inputs can be inputs in bulk in a, a scalable way. And in that case, you've got to anticipate this and stop it. So you have to engineer for worst case rather than average case or place limits and computation. And proper system engineers have known this stuff for decades. Right? Uh, if you, again, if you want to go back to the Tharac 25 failure, um, the, uh, the, the idea that the computer selects wrong energy was adversarial, you know, was randomly allocated a probability of 10 to the minus 11. And nobody stopped to realize that if the user edited the, uh, the beam energy too quickly, then that would happen in a sufficiently repeatable way that it caused a series of accidents. You know, th this is the kind of stuff that you have to look for. Um, it's not uh, qualitatively different from what we have before, but the context in which it appears is, is different and perhaps unfamiliar to many of the engineers who are trying to build this stuff. Anyway, if you're dealing with text, there are more things that you have to look at because um, inspired by the discovery that Chinese characters hold the, trans the translation, my student Nicholas Boucher um, uh, looked at coding more um, closely and Unicode, um, the standard that's used for encoding characters from foreign languages was used in the early days of phishing to obscure URLs. So can we play games with machine translation systems? And the answer is plenty. Uh, we've got a paper appearing on uh, Wednesday morning uh, next week at IEEE Security and Privacy in San Francisco. You can go along and listen to Nicholas giving the talk, or you can get our paper and download, and download it and read it. And what this basically points out is that you can screw around with text-based systems by using things like homoglyphs, the normal A and the Cyrillic A render to the same glyph, but are different in Unicode. And um, you can sabotage translation by swapping a handful of characters. You can also drop in zero width spaces. And um, this means you can sabotage things like translation and toxic content filtering. And there's many abuse cases that are perhaps outside the FDA's remit, but you never know. And even more deviously, Unicode has got bidirectionality control characters, BD characters, which let you swap text between le left to right and right to left. This is what you use if you're wanting to embed an English phrase in an Arabic text or uh, Urdu in Hindi or whatever. And the effect of these bidirectionality control characters um, is that by putting them in invisibly, you can write an email in English which says, please pay a thousand dollars to account number one, two, three. And Google Translate will turn this into Spanish as please pay to account number three, two, one. And you would have thought that the firms like Microsoft and Google and IBM have been around long enough to know to sanitize all inputs, but they don't. So this is a significant issue, I think, for the devices that use ML components. Is appropriate in input sanitization being done? And just in passing, I'll mention that BD characters can be used to attack software too. And if you Google for Trojan Source, you'll see that we've um, figured out ways in which you can use BD characters to cause source code to loop one way to a compiler and another way to a human. And um, many compilers and um, editors have fixed that over the last few months since we disclosed it. Uh, but one of the interesting things we learned from that is that while the compiler community was prepared to get off its behind um, and fix this and pay a lot of attention to it, the machine learning and natural language processing communities weren't.
right? They just don't have the same attitude towards software maintenance, towards picking up on bug reports and aggressively fixing stuff, right? Because the, the, the whole machine learning community is still kind of in its infancy. It's like, you know, cult culturally where um, the rest of computing was in about the 1980s before the Morris Warren come along and, and taught people to start taking care. So there's, you know, a, a cultural thing there um, with the maintenance of machine learning components that our experience with, um, you know, bad characters and Trojan source has, has brought to light. So moving up from the detail to higher levels in the stack, um, as robots, which I define roughly as systems involving machine learning components, mix and interact with humans, we can expect all sorts of tension and conflict. Because we already have tussles between humans and other humans, that's our history. And we already see robots trying to deceive and bully humans and humans trying to outwit robots. For robots, think websites. Websites are forever trying to hustle you to upgrade your hotel room to um, subscribe to something you didn't want to, to upgrade your free account to a premium subscription one and so on and so forth. And, and, and this is one of the things that wears us down with online life. And as robots become more physically embodied and as they start um, having weapons, you'll see robots fighting each other, robot swarms on the battlefield, or Bruchnar's nightmare of AI bots hacking each other where our systems become collateral damage. So what does this mean to the um, biomedical engineer? Well, one of the things that people are aware of in medicine um, is that it's important to know whether you're safe or whether you're under attack. Must I be alert or can I relax? Chronic stress and fatigue are toxic. And one of the best ways of helping people to get better is the placebo effect, take them to a spa, reassure them in a nice medical manner, um, you are safe now. And that means that their immune system can crank up to the max and start trying to fix what's wrong with them. And the, um, the placebo effect and its opposite, the nocebo effect have been written by quite a lot by medics. Um, the other side of the coin for security researchers is situational awareness. How do I know whether I'm under attack or not? And this has been largely ignored in security research because the things that we've been building up till now, like cryptographic mechanisms and access control mechanisms are designed to stop all the adversaries all the time. They keep even the NSA out, you know, even when you're not paying attention. But this grade of protection is just too expensive for humans um, in our everyday life. We can't all live in castles and drive around in armored cars. And so in our non-digital lives, we uh, rely on situational awareness of knowing when we're safe and knowing when we have to take care. We know when we're in our garden and the birds are singing and you react in one way. And if you're walking down a, a street in a bad neighborhood of a big city, you're a bit on edge and you react in different ways. Now, situational awareness is also going to be necessary in machine learning systems because it is too expensive for machine learning systems to anticipate all possible bad inputs. And so there's going to be, I believe, a whole lot of research around um, manners for robots, for want of a better word. How do you reassure humans, if you're a robot, that your intentions are good and pure and beneficent and, um, and friendly? And why should humans believe you if the robots are operated by big companies who are profit maximizers and trying to build monopolies? This is going to be one of the pain points. So basically, we humans have evolved sensitivity to, um, to threat and risk. And as this is out of sync with the modern world, it gets exploited by marketers and criminals who try to put us at our ease when we shouldn't be. Um, or get us upset in order that we don't pay attention to things that we should do. And now people are starting to be wary online and feel the hustle and machine learning systems are going to acquire a similar sensitivity because alarms are cheaper than robustness. And this means that um, lots of things from cars to toxic content filters are going to need some kind of situational awareness. And um, there are other um, things that we haven't discussed in much detail because there isn't time in a one-hour lecture, the hope that uh, federation um, 
and um, differential privacy and so on can fix privacy, despite the fact that the incentives for anonymization as a means of doing privacy are completely wrong. In passing, I'd like to point you at Arvind Narayanan's lovely analysis of machine learning snake oil. He points out that machine learning has made real progress for tasks of perception, um, such as spotting faces or in the medical device spotting tumors. It's made patchy process for tasks of judgment, such as spam and toxic content filtering, but it needs constant human assistance with training in the hard corner cases. And this is also something to think of in terms of devices that look for tumors. And it's made no progress at all in tasks of social prediction, such as employee performance and future criminal behavior. And yet many of the machine learning systems that are being sold are pretending to fix these unfixable social prediction tasks. In short, dealing with people is hard. And finally, Arvind reminds us that most AI startups don't use machine learning at all in the sense in which a computer science department would understand that. Uh, most of them uh, are in fact using um, ancient stuff like regressions if they use statistical um, techniques at all. So this brings me to the possible research questions. Um, when we build systems that incorporate machine learning models, where are the new vulnerabilities? And how do you deal with them? How um, you know, do you put the kinds of measures in the machine learning itself, which means making the machine learning models robust, uh, still vulnerable, but less sensitive? Or do you put them elsewhere? Do you use compensating controls? How could and should machine learning models interact with human complexity? Now, if you've got a medical device whose job is to spot some particular type of condition, uh, that may not be a big deal, but just you wait. Um, you will start seeing medical devices pretty soon, I think, um, which will be uh, anticipating um, and interacting with more complex stuff. And this brings us on to safe usability, which, as we know, is already a huge problem. So what happens as usability gets more adversarial? Um, as um, robots of various kinds start being given uh, business model missions as well as just caring missions. Um, already, we have seen is issues, for example, with, um, with insulin pumps, where my colleagues have been helping reverse engineer the software in various insulin pumps so that diabetics who know how to program can um, program their own artificial pancreas rather than having to use software that was written by a drug company lawyer. Um, next bundle of questions is around what can be done about privacy if big models are trained in identifiable health data. And finally, let me leave you with a philosophical problem. Um, there's a, a law prof at Georgetown Law um, tweeted a couple of days ago saying that at their school they're not going to use um, artificial intelligence and machine learning anymore when they're talking about policy. Because to a very great extent, this is just marketing language. This is just companies like Google and Microsoft and Amazon and Apple and you know, all the dominant tech firms that we know to love and know to hate, um, trying to um, recast things that they have been doing for many, many years, but to describe them differently uh, because people respond more positively to claims about AI than they uh, respond to claims about algorithms or claims about computers. So it's, it's a means of refreshing uh, the marketing language uh, of tech companies who want to be able to disrupt stuff, that is, push the boundaries of the law or even break the law, um, in, in, in the hope of getting some kind of business advantage. And so uh, that, as I can sum it up, is um, five points that might hopefully um, give research ideas um, all the way from systems engineering through to um, the philosophical under underpinnings of this discipline. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Ross. This has been uh, an eye-opening uh, uh, lecture, especially on uh, how the machine learning can fail and how it might be protected. Uh, we do have a lot of questions. Before we get into those, I just want to say we have a poll that's about to appear in Zoom while we're taking Q&A, and uh, I would appreciate it if attendees would just quickly go through for these three questions to give us a little bit of feedback, um, and uh, at the same time, we'll, we'll talk now. Um, so uh, there, there are a number of questions. Uh, I think I'll get to, um, uh, there was a question about uh, uh, data anonymization uh, early on. So uh, Zach was asking, given the intractability 
uh, of data anonymization um, and the drive toward AI and ML driven personalized medicine, to what extent do you think there's an inherent trade off between privacy and effectiveness uh, in this AI ML context for software and medical devices? Well, it's uh, a long answer to that would be very long and detailed. Um, my student Ilya Shumailov recently wrote a paper with some people at the University of Toronto on why um, federated privacy doesn't work with deep neural networks. And I suggest that you get that and read it if you want all the brutal technical details. Um, where you can find trade-off points on the curve is hard um, when uh, people are not prepared really to admit that the curve exists and where the, the advocates of taking data to uh, build devices uh, won't even engage in the discussion. So there's a fair amount of debunking has to be done there first. Right, thanks uh, for providing that pointer to our, our audience. Um, the next question is from Kazad and he asks, particularly for medical devices, um, is there any consensus answer to this question? So if attacks are possible, but rare and not scalable, can't we just detect them instead in alarm? Um, so would this answer be dependent on the severity of the harm from the attack? What are some things to consider here? Well, for medical devices, it would depend on the context. Um, if, a, a, if a device is uh, purely diagnostic, um, then an alarm is a sufficient response to a rare event. If um, the uh, temperature, instead of saying this person's temperature is 39 degrees, just says malfunction and flashes a red light, then the doctor will go and get another thermometer. And if all else fails, they might get an old fashioned glass and alcohol thermometer. Right, so, so, so that's perfectly okay. It's somewhat less okay if a car that you're driving in suddenly says, I'm confused, you take over. Um, because um, a, a Tesla will typically do that about one second before you go into the back of a truck at 100 miles an hour and get killed. And this is why there's um, a whole bunch of um, arguments and litigation and so on between Tesla and your colleagues over at the, uh, the uh, uh, NHTSA and so on about how accidents are um, recorded and whether you consider a car to have been under autopilot if it's been under autopilot in the 10 seconds before the collision and so on and so forth. So the answer to this is it's highly dependent on the circumstances. And if something goes wrong and you sound the alarm, is that sufficient to prevent further harm? And if not, you may have to back off a little bit and think about it. Thanks for that response. Uh, the next question is, could you discuss the uh, importance or the challenges um, in the role of algorithm explainability? So there's this, uh, uh, of course, explainable AI, but discuss the role of algorithm explainability in the context of medical device security. I'm, I'm wondering uh, if you have any thoughts in that space, uh, especially on things like tamper detection. Well, the problem with that is that when you're doing vision type tasks, um, like looking for macular degeneration in an optical tomograph, you're going to use deep neural networks because they're so much better than everything else. They're miles and miles and miles better than anything else. And deep neural networks are intrinsically not very explainable. Now, um, one of the, um, I, I mean, they may be slightly explainable because the, the DNN could say, I think this is macular degeneration. Um, here are 20 confirmed cases of macular degeneration that look rather similar. Boom, 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 boom. Uh, but nonetheless, um, if there were an adversarial attack at that time, you could have something, you know, a cartoon picture of a kangaroo that was being misclassified as macular degeneration because it had just been tweaked the wrong way over the decision boundaries. And in a case like that, it would be visually obvious to a human that the, um, um, that the DNN classifier had got it completely wrong. So there might be some value in providing some um, justification like that. Uh, but even if you get some uh, machine learning model that um, in theory has got some explainability, something with a more linear model, if the dimensionality is high enough, um, then you can still get the same kind of adversarial attacks. So again, this question is hard. Now, we know from psychology that humans um, tend to take decisions on gut instinct and recognition and so on, because after all, we've got neural networks in our brains. Um, and we then come out with text afterwards to justify it, right? So, so very often the rationalization is 
um, is post hoc rather than, um, than, than anything systematic. But this is one of those questions to which there's probably never going to be a silver bullet answer. Yeah, I appreciate that nuance and thinking there. Um, so I think that's all the time we have for questions. We're, we're a minute over, so I apologize on that. I appreciate your staying a little late. Uh, again, this concludes the uh, uh, Circe FDA seminar series for the academic year and will return in September on third Thursdays. Uh, and uh, I'd like to just thank again, Professor Ross Anderson from Edinburgh University and uh, the University of Cambridge uh, in the UK for joining us. Uh, and uh, here you can see uh, the book I referred to earlier, Security Engineering. Uh, you'll find it on every desk uh, for any sort of serious security engineering course uh, globally. Uh, but thank you again, Ross, and thank uh, all the attendees for joining uh, over the last seven months.